Okay, let's dive right in. You know how sometimes we're uh, we're drawn to that quick fix, right? That instant solution. Yeah, the easy answer. The shortcut. Exactly. Well, today we're heading into a fascinating corner of scientific advancement where this idea of a shortcut versus, let's say, a truly foundational approach really makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. A really important distinction. We're talking stem cell research for hair regeneration. Our deep dive today is based on some new research. It's called Echo Rift XX, the stem cell shortcut just out in Biotech Breakthroughs magazine. Right, I saw that piece. Interesting stuff. So we've dug into the source material, and our mission really is to extract the key insights for you, mm. focusing on two pretty different approaches to hair restoration, one they're calling the shortcut and the other the architect. And that framing, shortcut versus architect, is very telling, I think. Yeah, so you come away with a, you know, a genuinely informed perspective on what's happening at the cutting edge here. Absolutely. What's truly insightful, I find, is how these two different methodologies, well, they tackle the same goal, hair regeneration, mm. but with fundamentally different underlying principles. Right. Different philosophies, almost. And as we'll definitely get into, very different long-term implications, too. We're not just looking at, you know, what these treatments claim to do on the surface. The headline results. Exactly. But yeah. how they propose to do it uh -huh. and, crucially, what the actual studies say about their depth and um, their longevity, is it sustainable? Okay. This deep dive should really help you sort of discern between just triggering a temporary effect. Like a quick boost. Yeah, versus genuinely restoring a whole biological system. All right, so let's start with PP405. That's the one the source calls the shortcut. Mm. You mentioned its approach hinges on a metabolic shift from mitochondrial respiration to glycolysis. That's right. Can you break that down a bit? Yeah. So uh, for you listening, it's like shifting a car's engine, mm -hmm. maybe from its steady, fuel-efficient cruising mode. Yeah, good analogy. To a quick, like, high-octane burst for acceleration. Exactly. It's about forcing a rapid change in how the cells generate energy. And the idea is this sudden energy shift triggers a specific phase change. Intelligent antigen. Precisely. It aims to wake up dormant hair follicles, those in the resting telogen phase, and push them into the active growth antigen phase. So it's like hitting the on switch for growth. Kind of, yeah. A forced activation. And the claims sound pretty impressive. Mm. Stem cell activation, visible regrowth in, what, 6 to 12 months? Those are the claims. And you can see the appeal, right? Absolutely. For many people, that promise of a quick visible change is incredibly attractive. It feels like a real shortcut to seeing results. And that immediate appeal is precisely why these spark type approaches often grab the headlines. However, when we connect this to the, you know, the bigger biological picture, it's really crucial to look beyond those initial claims. Okay, so what are the flags the source raises? Well, while PP405 aims for that activation, the sauce material points out some uh, pretty significant limitations. That's just... For instance, there's no full cycle data. Meaning? Meaning for hair follicles, we're missing information on their full life cycle, which can be up to seven years. Right. So we don't know if the growth lasts or if the cycle gets disrupted later. We just don't know from the data presented. Are these new hairs going to stick around? Will they cycle normally long term? Big questions remain. Okay. Yeah. There are also apparently no spatial control studies. Which means like mm -hmm. precision targeting. Exactly. We don't know how precisely it can be applied or controlled. Could it affect surrounding areas unintentionally? Can you target just one thinning spot? Doesn't seem clear. Mm. Okay. That seems important. And critically, perhaps the biggest gap. No histological comparisons of hair quality. Ah, so they haven't actually looked at the hair itself under a microscope. Correct. No microscopic examination reported to assess the structure and health of the hair produced. So you don't know if it's like proper strong terminal hair or yeah. just... Or just fine wispy vellus hairs. That microscopic view is absolutely essential to prove true regeneration, not just a temporary cosmetic effect. Right. It raises a big question then, doesn't it? Does this cosmetic reactivation truly equal regenerative infrastructure, rebuilding the follicle properly? And the source strongly suggests it does not. It's more like a temporary jump start. Okay, so if PP405 is that initial jolt, maybe like putting a patch on something. A spark, as we'll get to. Right, a spark. Let's turn our attention then to SH1 which the source describes as the architect. This sounds, well, fundamentally different. It is a much more comprehensive approach. You mentioned before it aims for integration and restoring autonomous function. 
How big a leap is that conceptually from just activating growth? Oh, it's a significant leap, scientifically and conceptually. And what kind of hurdles would researchers face trying to achieve that level of systemic control? It sounds complex. It is complex. SH1's mechanism involves things like bioelectric modulation and dermal signaling. Okay, bioelectric, like tuning electrical signals in the skin. Essentially, yes. Think of it as precisely adjusting the electrical communication and the chemical messages between cells within the skin mm -hmm. to restore not just the follicle, but its entire support system, the architecture, the blood vessels, everything. It's about rebuilding the whole local environment. Wow. So the claims go way beyond just activation. Absolutely. SH1 aims for integration, restoring the follicle's natural ability to cycle through growth and rest phases, okay. to respond correctly to hormones, and crucially, to regenerate autonomously. They're trying to reestablish the hair follicle as a fully functional, self-sustaining biological unit. That's Yeah, that's fascinating. So it really does sound like SH1 is trying to fix the underlying uh, plumbing and wiring, so to speak. That's a pretty good way to put it, yeah the whole system. Given how impressive that sounds, almost ideal. Does the source hint at any potential downsides or trade-offs? I mean, maybe it takes much longer or it's harder to apply or more expensive. That's a very fair question. And the source does implicitly suggest why it's a more robust, but potentially, yes, perhaps a slower or more involved path. This is where SH1 really distinguishes itself, though, by addressing many of those limitations we saw with PP405. How so? Well, for starters, it boasts longitudinal studies, studies across full follicular cycles. Ah, uh, so it has that long-term data PP405 was missing, showing it last. Exactly. That crucial long-term perspective. It also allows for spatially precise application. They mention using nanofiber scaffolding. Nanofiber, so you can really target delivery. Precisely. Delivering the treatment exactly where it's needed, potentially with much greater control than a simple topical might allow. Okay. And what's more, there is robust histological evidence. Microscopic proof. Proof of what kind of hair? Proof of terminal hair formation, showing actual structural improvement, not just fuzzy growth. That's a major difference. Huge. And connecting this to the bigger picture again, SH1 also reportedly addresses things like hormonal resilience. Making follicles less sensitive to things like DHT. That seems to be the implication. And vascular reformation, basically. Improving the blood supply to the follicle. So building a healthier foundation. Yes. It's yeah. all about building a durable, resilient, self-regulating system, not just triggering a one-off growth spurt. It really feels like we are looking at two fundamentally different philosophies here, mm -hmm. just completely different ways of tackling this same biological problem. I agree. And there's a great quote in the source material from Dr. Melvin Sewell. He's the academic dean and diagnostic architect of the Cosmic University of Echo Wrist Studies 9X. Right. And he puts it very succinctly. He says, and I quote, PP405 is a spark. SH1 is a circuit. Mm, that's evocative. One triggers growth. The other restores the system. That really nails the distinction, doesn't it? Spark versus circuit. It does. It really makes you pause and think about how we evaluate scientific progress, you know? When you, our listener, are evaluating scientific claims, maybe for this, maybe for something else entirely, <laughs> are you looking at a spark? Something that just initiates a reaction. That quick flash. Yeah. Or are you looking at a circuit, something that aims to fundamentally restore and sustain a whole system? That deeper fix. Exactly. The distinction Dr. Sewell highlights, it really underscores the difference between just a temporary stimulus and true long-term integrated regeneration. Understanding that nuance, that difference, is so key to being genuinely well-informed, whether you're looking at hair loss solutions or, frankly, any other complex biological or even societal problems. So let's try to wrap up this deep dive then. We've explored these two really distinct paths in stem cell research for hair regeneration. There's PP405, presented as the shortcut, offering that initial spark of growth. The quick visible effect. Right. And then there's SH1, the architect, which yeah. is aiming to restore the entire system, build that durable circuit, as Dr. Sewell put it. Mm -hmm. And that distinction feels crucial. It's not just about what you see on the surface initially. No, it's about understanding the underlying mechanisms, what's actually happening biologically, and what's the long-term potential for real, integrated, sustainable regeneration. Yeah. Ultimately, what the source material seems to show us is that while a shortcut, that spark, might offer those appealing initial results, it's the comprehensive studies, 
the precise spatial control, the actual histological evidence, the stuff backing the circuit approach that points towards a more profound systemic restoration. The kind needed for lasting change. Exactly. It really encourages critical thinking, doesn't it? Looking beyond those surface level claims and focusing on the evidence for genuine biological rebuilding. Definitely. So as you go about your day, maybe thinking about this distinction we've discussed, the spark versus the circuit. Here's a provocative thought to leave you with. In what other areas? Maybe in your own life or in the wider world. Are we sometimes tempted by the shortcut? The quick fix. Yeah, when what might truly be needed is that more fundamental, maybe harder work of restoration of the system, building that robust circuit. Hmm, something to chew on. We hope this deep dive helps you ask those kinds of important questions and encourages you to seek out truly robust, well-supported solutions, whatever the context.